it's kind of easy to look back now, but who knew that the mobile phone cameras would be would kind of and it's happened so fast. It's like taken us by surprise. And I have I've I've you know questioned myself like why didn't I see this? If like me, you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, you might remember the days when taking a picture sounded like this, or even this. When I was growing up, photography studios were as popular as the neighborhood falafel joint. You'd find these shops in just about every corner, big yellow boards with that word Kodak written on them. I had one such studio in the next building. It was called Al Haja Photo Studio. We'd go in and drop off our little roll of film and they would print out our pictures on this noisy whirring machine. Remember as well, those were the days of dark rooms where photos were actually developed. So why are we indulging in a little bit of nostalgia? Because today's guest, a third culture kid who spent a lot of his childhood in Dubai, spearheads the premier photo workshop and printing center in Dubai after he pivoted to it from brand marketing. From Amaya Media, I'm Chirag Desai and you're listening to Tales of the Trade, a show about Dubai's entrepreneurs and pioneers and the stories not just of their companies, but the communities they brought to life. Mohammed Somji identifies strongly with being a photojournalist, having documented stories via photography all over the UAE for a couple of decades now. And perhaps somewhere his ancestry has a part to play in this desire to document people and how they progress. His ancestor has actually moved to East Africa from India over 200 years ago. And although his father moved to Dubai when Muhammad was quite young, his Tanzanian roots played a big part in his childhood. I uh, remember going back to Tanzania every summer, which I, um, I'm really glad that my dad did that. You know, holidays seem to be longer than, than they are now. But um, it was great because I felt like I was able to connect with home. We have all these kind of different facets. And I feel like, you know, the people in India don't see me as Indian. People in Africa don't see me as African. And then we live in Dubai, you know. Uh, so at least, you know, going going to Tanzania in summer maybe made me feel like there was... Uh, an attachment or there was something, you know, and um, I mean, it's not very strong. It's a bit tenuous, but at least there's something, you know. But you still have family there? I do. Um, Many of them have left since, but I do have some family, so I can um, uh, avoid paying for a hotel when I go to Tanzania. (laughs) Dubai is home for Mohammed, or as he puts it, home with an asterisk. After leaving the city for a few years, he came back to Dubai towards the end of 1996 and needed to get serious about making a space for himself here. I remember getting the Jabal Ali business directory and I started sending actual letters at the time, which I typed up, signed and went to the post office and uh, sent. And I only got far as, uh, as far as B. But within B, we had Black & Decker, um, which was a company based in Jabal Ali. And I had sent them a letter to say, hi, you know, I've just come back from uh, uh, the States where I graduated. I have lived here all my life. I'm looking to get into a sales and marketing role. For context, like Black & Decker was the company when we were growing up, right? I mean, there were a few others. Of course, you had your Philips, I think, and a couple others. But Black & Decker was the name to go to when it came to housewares. Yeah, absolutely. It's in every household. It's a good brand name. And it's something that I'm excited about. And I was. I spent two and a half years there. And um, Black & Decker then got sold um, to uh, another company in the U.S. So at the time, they didn't know whether they would close the housewares divisions and kind of stick to the industrial power tools. And that's something I wasn't excited about. I really wanted to work in the consumer space. So um, I left and I joined Sharp Electronics for a bit. Now, like Black & Decker, Sharp was another company living its heydays in Dubai and a household name for electronics at the time. He then moved on to another popular company called Kraft Foods. You may have heard of them. They ran brands like Toblerone and Maxwell House Coffee. But as time passed and those entrepreneurial itches got stronger, he decided to make a switch and pursue stories through photography. The tipping point was reading a book by Naomi Klein called uh, No Logo, which, um, you know, I'd been feeling some of those things, but, you know, she articulated really well. And I felt I was part of this machine that was, um, you know, uh, uh, inherently bad for us as society and it was uh you know kind of overly capitalistic to you know that the expense of a lot of people a few people were kind of benefiting and it started making me think about what I really wanted to do or what I wanted to be part of and what kind of legacy I wanted to have and I was reading a lot about socio political issues especially 911 and happened around that time and and so I came across these photo essays and uh, I really kind of started getting interested in the power of the image being able to tell a story that was a lot more powerful than just, you know, 
uh, words, and I thought this is interesting. This is something that I can, you know, get behind. And it wasn't just the photography aspect of it; it was also kind of learning about people and uh, their stories, and you know, complex issues, and using photography as a way to anchor it. And I like to think at the time that I was a bit creative, and you know, I would always love the. Uh, part in my work at Craft uh, um, and Black & Decker where I got involved in the brand design aspect and also kind of uh, doing the campaigns and getting photos taken and things like that. So, you know, it wasn't something that was alien to me. It was something that I was familiar with, but I wasn't deeply invested in. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave my cor- leave the corporate world and um, going to become a documentary photographer. And in many ways, I was naive. I was drawn to this idea of like trying to change the world, you know, uh, one photo essay at, a, essay at a time. And I learned very quickly that that was uh, very naive and also um, not possible in today's media uh, landscape. And um, it's also difficult to convince editors in, in uh, the West to uh, give assignments to, um, you know, people that were had my name or, you know, uh, because the what still happens, unfortunately, is a lot of uh, photographers from the West are kind of parachuted out into the, uh, you know, the global South, if you like. And they're telling our stories um, for us. And so I was like, OK, until I kind of sort out what I'm going to do, I need to uh, make some money. And uh, so one of the things that I made sure that I had was some kind of safety net. So for six months, I convinced my, my boss at the time, uh, the owner of the company, to let me work part time. And it allowed me some breathing space. And um, I continued to do some uh, freelance work for them while starting to learn about photography, uh, get my technical skills up to speed, um, research projects that I wanted to do. I took a workshop in Spain. um, And, you know, it allowed me to be ready when I finally got there. And when I got there, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to have passion projects that I'm going to pursue in my terms because nobody's hiring me anyways. And I want to tell the stories that I want to tell. And um, I'm going to have to start doing some commercial work. And because I had a background in marketing and brand management, I was able to speak to companies and brands who needed photographs and say, OK, look, I'm going to I'm going to do this for you. In no other city anywhere in the world would you be able to get photography work that quickly without that experience or a portfolio. But, you know, it, it was a boom time in Dubai and people needed images for, you know, whether it was their events or whether it was for their campaigns. Today, Somji is the premier face of Gulf Photo Plus, or GPP, the go-to place in Dubai for photography workshops and talks, as well as artist exhibitions and printing. But GPP was actually founded around 2005 by Karen Hook, who had put together a community with a shared interest in learning photography. And she had um, cuddled up some money together with her friends and uh, brought a photographer from the U.S., from San Francisco, to teach a workshop in film photography because that was still the uh, dominating technology. Digital had just come by, but it was still too expensive and it wasn't there for the, the, the masses. And, um, you know, so all her friends were, you know, really excited when this workshop happened. So they were like, please do this next year. So she got her Media City license and went to, I think, Canon. And Canon gave her some money to um, invite him and maybe bring another guy, you know. So, um, and so we had kept in touch and, you know, when she had learned about me moving from the corporate, uh, world to kind of doing photography and she said, Hey, let's have a coffee. I want to talk to you. She was leaving town and she said, I have, um, this, uh, name Gulf Photo Plus and I have a hot desk in Media City and I'm, you know, you may have a lot of business uh, contacts. Maybe somebody wants to buy that. And I was like, Hmm, I think I know someone. So I had some savings. Um, so I said, I'll do it. And, um, and, you know, this, I think we signed uh, our agreement October or November 2007. And this is the same time, like a month later, the market just collapsed. And as it is, a lot of people, you know, friends and family were like, are you crazy? You're leaving a good corporate job. You had, you know, uh, exciting prospects ahead of you and you're going to become a photographer. Do that on your weekend, I would hear, you know. Tell me why you said yes to that agreement, though. Were you thinking is, okay, well, I'm getting a license and a name uh, associated with photography and the fact that there'll be at least an annual thing I can do? No, it was much more than that. I think um, a few months before that, I had gone to Spain and um, I had uh, met some people who uh, were at this workshop and it was a documentary storytelling workshop. And um, it's telling that a lot of the people that I met there, I'm still very good friends with, and we've actually worked together. One of them, the, the person who set it up, uh, curated our last exhibition at Gulf Photo Plus. 
And what I what I saw there was this this kind of fraternity and solidarity between people in that photography world who um, were very helpful and who were um, going out of their way to uh, write to me to say, hey, Mohammed, you know, I know you're making this journey from this. Um, here are some grants and here are some people that you can meet. And I was just like, wow, I'd never seen that in the business world. What Mohammed could see, therefore, was that GPP had the potential to become a platform to support photographers while giving him the support he needed to pursue his passion of telling stories through photos. The plan was that this was going to be something I would do on the side and I would pursue my own work. But because we started getting really busy and I was starting to do a lot of workshops, teaching myself and getting other people to help me as demand grew, um, that part was taking a back seat. And it always kind of was something that was nagging me and it, you know to 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 till today i feel like i don't devote enough time to what i you know principally left my job to do and um you know but i've taken some steps in the last year to be able to do that more and you know i'm partly successful mixed uh, reviews on that so what Muhammad did to make sure that he didn't let go of his original passion, he set up another entity called Seeing Things with a partner Amaresh who was specializing in food photography, Somji was more architecture and lifestyle. And so seeing things wasn't really a backup plan, but it was a way to tap into his real passion of telling stories through photos, while GPP explored the more uncharted territories of setting up a platform and training center for photographers. GPP, like, you know, nothing like that existed. You know, in the beginning, it was like, let's see what happens with this. You know, but at the same time, while I was, you know, going for meetings with GPP or teaching a workshop, I'd go for a shoot after because I needed to make sure. Because, you know, when we first started, income just wasn't coming in. There was, you know, so I needed to uh, kind of, tick that, you know, keep that ticking. And so what I would do was do photography assignments. And so when GPP became, in effect, a full-time job, I um, I thought, okay, I can't shoot as much for my clients. So I hired somebody from Argentina at the time who was a friend of a friend. She had graduated from uh, a photography college in uh, Buenos Aires. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there for a second. I know Argentina is not the U.S. Right. and doesn't entirely contradict your original point, which is, hey, they import photographers from elsewhere and tell their stories. Why Argentina then? Um, so I had a good friend who was a client and, um, you know, uh, she trusted me with a lot of the work that I was doing for her. And um, and I said to her that, you know, I'm kind of struggling to kind of keep up with my photography assignments. And, and she said, look, I have this friend who's, uh, she's one of my best friends. She's graduating from photography school. Um, she will, you know, uh, uh, work her heart out for you and uh, you should consider her. And... I knew that if you were a good photographer and you were in Dubai, you're not going to work for someone, right? You're going to do your own thing. And so I thought, okay, let me um, speak to her, kind of see her work. We Skyped. Um, and, you know, I had Rosie's um, endorsement. So, yeah, I, you know, she was great and she took up a lot of, uh, absorbed a lot of that work that we were getting and was was uh, kept the client so happy that we we grew that too. And then it became a thing, like a, a, a bigger thing with like, you know, a few more employees. And we absorbed that within the ecosystem of GPP. So same accountant, same physical space. It was registered on the same uh, premises, different trade license, of course. So as Mohammed started focusing his energies entirely behind GPP, and despite coming out of the global financial crisis when they began, a few things were lining up for the industry at large. Digital photography was going mainstream around that time. You could now buy professional cameras for under the $1,000 barrier. Mirrorless cameras were gaining in popularity. And then, of course, in 2007, a new device arrived that meant that there was a camera in the hand of every individual. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Support for this episode of Tales of the Trade comes from In5. In5 is a leading platform for entrepreneurs and startups, providing simplified business setup, creative workspaces, mentorships, workshops and events, and access to a network of over 100 investors and strategic partners. More than 200 of the region's fastest growing startups call In5 their home having attracted over 319 million dirhams in funding and creating more than 400 jobs across the tech, media, and design industries. You can also be a part of a thriving startup community where great ideas are nurtured into successful businesses. The place is here. Your time is now. Visit infi.ae for more. Our thanks to Infi for their support of this show and Amaya Media. 
Welcome back. I'm Chirag and you're listening to Tales of the Trade with our guest Muhammad Sumji, director at Gulf Photo Plus and founder of Seeing Things Photography. So by 2009, GPP was getting quite busy and they'd already been contacted by international photographers who were visiting them or just wanted to collaborate with them in Dubai. And this is when he brought on a partner, Hala, whom he'd known from his college days. They connected almost instantly on the larger vision. And together, they brought Gulf Photo Plus into its current home at al Sarkar Avenue. I went to al Sarkar Avenue, and I remember when I first called them, they were like, whatever. <laughs> you know, they completely ignored me. They were like, who is this guy? Yeah. And I still joke uh, with the person who uh, was in the sales uh, team at the, at the time. But when we um, made a case for it, we uh, invited them over to see, uh, we shared with them the kind of, you know, press that we had received and stuff like that. Uh, we were the, like the fourth gallery, the third gallery there, you know, um, or the fourth. And um, and so, you know, we were a gallery space. And so, you know, we were going to do some art programming. And so they were like, okay, this is something that we could... we could uh, More aligned with what they're doing as well, yeah. When we were at Knowledge Village, we were doing workshops and we had a, a small uh, IKEA shelf where we had books that we sold uh, to people who came to the workshop. Um, and we were doing consulting for different brands. And so we knew that by moving to the other space, we now had the opportunity to offer our you know, studio workshops. Um, we could have a space dedicated to selling um, products. So you know, whether it's cameras or books or photography accessories, um, we could have multiple workshops um, that, that could be happening at the same time. And we had a gallery space. So we needed a curator and somebody who managed the gallery and the art side of it. Um, we needed a, an accountant, which we had managed ourselves before. But, you know, because of the, the, the many different streams of revenue, we needed to make sure that we had somebody to help us with that. Um, we had to have um, a receptionist, somebody who was at front of house to be able to attend to our calls and to attend to walk-ins because that's something we didn't have before. We were in Knowledge Village and people only came because they had a purpose. Um, now people were just walking in because we had galleries next door. And then we needed somebody to kind of be our kind of driver and space, uh, you know, maintain the space, kept it clean, um, managed all the inventory of the studio lights and things like that. So it all added up. And before we knew it, we were, you know, a team of, um, I think, nine or 10. And our challenge was that we needed a multidisciplinary space that, you know, provided us an office space, a studio space, a gallery space, and that, you know, we didn't have a lot of money to do it. And we were very adamant about not getting any financing. We had to self-finance this because I had seen a lot of businesses in that time fold because they couldn't, you know, uh, repay loans. And we, Hala and I had made it very clear that we would not going to um, extend ourselves beyond what we could afford. So you're talking about the business not taking any debt. Correct. Did you consider getting an investor, for example, instead? We did. And we had a couple of people who had offered and we said that we didn't want to. Um, we were very happy with the arrangement that we had. Um, and if we could make uh, the numbers work for the fit out that we wanted, um, we would not, uh, you know, solicit any financing. Um, I was I was filing uh, my papers on, on my Dropbox and I found the um, Google Drive actually, and I found the analysis that I'd made at the time. And I was like, I was crazy to like, you know, take that chance because, you know, we went from you know, expectations of a certain amount uh, in terms of revenue to like, you know, uh, uh, six times as much because of the bigger space that we had and, you know, that we were going to do printing and exhibition sales and, and, you know, some of those things worked, some of those things didn't. It was very brave at the time and I, I didn't realize it until now and I'm seeing it that if I had to make that call now, I'd be a lot more wary. But of course, it was a different time. You know, the industry has changed a lot and it's changed so rapidly that it, you know, took me by surprise too. But um, um, it was very bullish and it was very, um, you know, gung-ho. And fortunately, we were able to match those expectations for the first few years um, just because, you know, we had the space to be able to do more things. We live in an era where everybody's a photographer today. Our smartphones are fantastic cameras. And while that's great from a mainstream adoption point of view, it makes the camera almost a commodity. So today, the direct competition from photography centers doesn't just come from camera companies, but phone manufacturers as well. And as Mohammed notes, it's hard to keep competing when someone new is always offering something for free while you have to sustain a business. I, I, I just think back to how different the market or the industry was at that time versus now, which is like seven years later, you know, um, the mobile phone interrupted or disrupted everything um, and has played a big role in what has become of GPP since then um, in terms of the camera market has been shrinking since 2016. 
um, and continues to shrink at very high rates. Um, and that's changed, you know, so people aren't buying as many cameras. And um, and because of that, the camera manufacturers are offering a lot more uh, workshops by themselves. And most of them are for free. And so it's hard to compete with free. So we've had to, you know, sit down and really recalibrate our business and, uh, you know, look at alternative or additional sources of revenue. And uh, uh, and it's been a challenge. And um, I think we have, uh, for the most part, uh, been able to find a way to stay afloat. And listening to Kemsley's uh, podcast, I think we have a lot of the same uh, challenges. We have to fend for ourselves. You know, we've had to be very... Um, adept and agile in, in, in finding new sources of revenue um, in very short times while navigating a market or industry that's changing literally on a monthly, quarterly basis when phones come out with different, you know, technologies. And even within the camera industry alone, the shift from DSLR to mirrorless has uh, affected how we do things and the kind of workshops that uh, were happening, plus the amount of resources that are online so people feel like, I don't need to take a workshop, I can go on YouTube. It's a very different experience and people learn that later, but, you know, it's these things that we have to really convince people. So we have to work a lot harder now than we used to before people would go online, photography training, workshops, classes, come to us, boom. You know, and now we have to really make the effort to um, to win the customer. And, um, and I think what we've done well is, um, you know, piggyback on this uh, social media craze where there's a lot of people who want um, content on a regular basis. This week on Tutorial Tuesday, I'm talking about lenses. Why would you pick something like this or pick something like this one per se? Is this where the idea of doing these like mini trainings and the Tutorial Tuesdays, right? Is that is that where this these ideas have come up? Totally. I think we've realized that now we have a bigger market in terms of absolute uh, numbers because now everyone's a photographer. Um, and how do we serve them? Also, how do we serve the people who are you know, trying to cater to them. So brands, for example, need um, help with their photography and video requirements. And, you know, for some of the things, they're going to go to a professional photographer or a studio. But for many of the things that they need to do on a regular basis, they need to take photos themselves. And so um, we've been successful in converting a lot of those people to doing one-on-one -on -one individual or custom bespoke training. So that's helped. And, um, you know, we have a very um, solid printing business because we uh, are all photographers. So Hala, myself, and a lot of the people who work with us are actually photographers. We know what we're doing with color management and, you know, with the kind of quality of paper and, and what people want. And, and so that's a business that we've grown um, significantly in the last few years that has offset some of the um, challenges we've had on the education side. And you've seen a, a clear decline in, uh, in attendance to workshops and stuff? As Absolutely, you were for sure. And, you know, it goes without saying, I mean, if the market camera market is shrinking and they have uh, more options for education like YouTube and what have you, then, then yes. And I think what we've done to address that is to offer other workshops that we weren't offering on a regular basis before, you know, so more medium to advanced workshops, mobile uh, video, mobile photo, mobile editing, you know, food, uh, family photography, you know, things like that. How do you see uh, A, the industry, let's say maybe in the next couple of years, and then where do you see GPP playing that? I think even though the um, mode of taking photos is changing, people still need photos, right, and videos. Um, so definitely we're looking at some of these growth areas, so video, um, you know, content for social media, content for, um, you know, brands. The other thing that we have worked on um, a lot is building our kind of art programming, and uh, we've been working with local, regional, and international organizations to be the kind of authority on photography. So whether it's um, working together with um, Warehouse 421 in Abu Dhabi to curate or, you know, put together an exhibition in their space, or whether it's working with the large organizations like, you know, Jamil Art Center or um, Dubai Tourism, uh, we have a service that we can provide. Uh, we've worked with uh, most of the phone manufacturers, um, whether it's trying to identify um, artists or photographers who can be their face or their ambassadors, because that's a space that we know very well. We know what's going on in the market. We know um, who the good photographers are. We can discern talent. So we'll often get big brands coming to us and saying, for our campaign, we need to identify six photographers, three males, three females, etc. And we have a pulse on that because we have our art programming that's very active and we have our festival an annually that... Um, we host exhibitions, so we, you know, are, are kind of 
very much in tune with what's going on in the local and regional market. And, you know, there are a lot of photography organizations, initiatives, and um, I think what we do very well and what sets us apart is we are very kind of uh, embedded or rooted in the region. And I think I've taken on more of a, a kind of curator mentor role in some of the younger photographers whose work we've shown or I've, uh, you know, been curating a festival in Holland, one of the top five uh, f photo festivals in the world. And I was appointed as the associate curator uh, for their edition last year and then again for next year. So I'm able to, um, you know, try and get our... Um, the work and the talent that's here an international uh, audience and that's what we'd like to do more of um, you know it's just like a company would hire an agency to do that we're that specialist agency if you look back now at everything you've done with gpp particularly uh, was there something you would like to do differently if you could start over yeah, I think even though we had a, an accountant or a, or a finance person when we moved to El Circle and our business model changed, um, I feel that uh, that person let us down in terms of not having a grasp. And I think many of the problems that we face today could have been uh, mitigated um, because, uh, you know, we, we I didn't kind of get the data analysis that I should have in terms of, uh, you know, forecasting and things like that. And, and again, that's our issue because we trusted that person and, you know, what have you. But I think uh, largely I would have had a much more tighter control on, on the finance or the accounting side, um, both of us. Um, I think um, being a bit more circumspect with the growth that we had, you know, you're, you're in this fervor and you're in this mode and uh, perhaps there we could have, you know, put the brakes on and some things. You know, it's hard to say. It's 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 kind of easy to look back now, but anticipating where the market would have gone so we could have made the changes that we've made now quicker. But, you know, who knew that the mobile phone cameras would be, would kind of... Yeah, that's a bit of a know. tough one. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's happened so fast. It's like taken us by surprise. And I have, I've, I've, you know, questioned myself, like, why didn't I see this? You know, is it a, is it a deficiency in me? Did I screw this up? You know, and, and I think I realized that, like, I wasn't negligent. It's just going to happen so fast. It kind of crept up be behind you, you know? And, uh, and if anything, it's made me a lot more um, conscientious about, being aware of trends and every time there's a new camera on the market, I'm curious to see what's happening, you know, um, with the industry and what changes are, are happening. Mohammed hasn't quite forgotten what he originally set out to do. While he finds running workshops and exhibitions extremely fulfilling, he still wants to pursue telling his own stories and expanding creatively as well. And so as Gulf Photo Plus evolved and expanded, he had a partner now, employees, people in key roles, he was finally able to take a step back and look again at his other venture, seeing things, which had also been growing well since 2008. Two years ago, or almost two years ago, we made the decision to have our own space so that it wouldn't encroach upon the GPP space because it would then conflict with workshops or, you know, using the studio or the gallery space. And we needed to have a larger space. You know, as our GPP business has struggled, seeing things conversely has grown. And it we've been able to kind of leverage or capitalize on this need for a lot of, you know, big brands, but also small to medium brands who have a voracious appetite for content, who cannot afford the big ad agencies, you know, where there's a lot of fat and, you know, it's expensive to produce content. You know, the balance of where I've been working has uh, changed as well in the sense that it's taken me away from the kind of daily grunt work and to have a much more um, business development role and uh, almost an advisory role in the last, um, you know, year or so, um, while I can focus on growing the seeing things business. And it's also uh, been interesting for me to... Um, uh, try and um, multitask if you like and and the third component is my own personal artwork which I'm trying to um, also accelerate. Is there a specific way you go about splitting your time? Because they're within the photography space there is some overlap in the sense that it's not completely different I don't have to be in a different mindset and I can kind of cycle over to um, GPP and um, have a quick meeting so I was just there today for a quick half an hour to sign some papers and meet uh, with some of the team uh, to talk about something and w with the way work is we can kind of work from anywhere but yeah sometimes it's difficult to kind of be in the zone you know for something and and obviously it also means that you have if you wear two hats or three hats you have three times as much work you know and I think when I left the corporate world I was very much um, I very much signed on to this notion of working all the time and uh, that hasn't changed and uh, I wish I had more time uh, uh, for myself you know or uh, for you know more time to spend with the family but 
it's um you know it's a choice that you make right to um it's not a choice that you make but it's 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 uh, it's not a luxury that you have necessarily you know i'm always fascinated by how entrepreneurs view well entrepreneurship and i say that because starting a business and running it is a very individual process it can get extremely lonely when the buck stops with you while you're also in charge of the well-being of employees and customers and yet there is such a draw to it right even for people who've never dreamt of owning their own business when i see these um articles on Harvard Business Review and I think entrepreneurship like you said has become a buzzword has become like a, a fad almost and it's like now it's cool yeah. yeah yeah and I don't know what the success rate is but I'm willing to bet that there are a lot more failures than there are successes and I never thought I would be an entrepreneur when I first got out of college and I was working I was very kind of happy doing what I was doing and you know life happens and then um you know you take a a, a path that you don't expect to kind of chart for yourself and you end up where you are. And, um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, it's not that easy. You have to have a temperament and a mentality for it. I know lots of people, you know, who tell me that they could never be an entrepreneur. And, um, just, just like, I don't think I could be a bean counter or somebody who's sitting behind a desk all the time. You know, the idea of entrepreneurship being somebody who is, you know, bootstrapping or got money and setting up a business with a purpose to, you know, uh, basically bring more money than, than they spend is great. But I think you can also be an entrepreneur in your job in the sense that you could build something out of what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like you, it, it, Because I don't think it's just the, uh, the, the point of owning your own business. This is something you could do inside your job, for example, Correct. that you're getting at. Correct, right? correct. But, uh, um, you know, I'm all for people... Uh, and, 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 you know, I, we, we come across a lot of people that, who come to Gulf Photo Plus, want to take a few workshops and become a photographer. And, you know, it's very difficult, but we, have, we tell them, and I always tell the guys to be, you know, kind of pass on the same message that, look, they could be brilliant creatives and brilliant photographers, but if you don't have the temperament to be in a, a client meeting or to understand a brief or to have that discipline to invoice people and to kind of do all the paperwork that comes with, you know, uh, uh, doing a business. The, the non-glamorous side of entrepreneurship, which people don't often talk about. Totally, totally. Like, you know, I just sat uh, for the last two hours before you came doing an Excel sheet. And, you know, that's not glamorous, you know what I mean? Or even like retouching photographs uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, taking out um, uh, stains from a building <laughs> in an <laughs> architecture photograph. But, you know, there there are... There's a lot of that that people tend to gloss over and not, don't appreciate that, you know what, what goes into it. I mean, listening to your uh, the the uh, Tales of the Trade podcast, I think it's a recurring theme that you know people um, don't have time for things that they would like to do or hang out with their friends and and uh, you know and, and these are real sacrifices. And you know, before people jump on this kind of bandwagon, um, I think they need to realize these things. You can find all of Muhammad's work at his website, muhammadsomji.com. And of course, check out GPP's workshop schedule by visiting golfphotoplus.com. And if you enjoyed listening to Muhammad, he also joined us on our other show, Krama Sutra, for an episode called The Outliers, where he helped us understand how the various communities landed up living in different parts of Dubai. There's a link to all of this in our show notes. This episode of Tales of the Trade was produced by me, Chirag Desai, with support from Gaia, Abhishek Venkata Subramanian, Sukena Kazmi, and Zainab Ujaini. Original music for the show was composed by Rhino Erlings. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do share it with your friends. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Connect with us on Instagram at talesofthe.trade and find all of our episodes for free in your favorite podcast player or on the web at talesofthe.trade. Tales of the Trade is part of the Amaya Media Network. You can find out more at amaya.media. New episodes of this season will be available every second Tuesday. 